Let's get right into it. Nate Solder announced yesterday that he is going to opt out of the 2020 season. And let's read directly from the statement that Nate Solder and his family released. This is the key paragraph, quote, Our family has health concerns, most notably our son's ongoing battle with cancer, as well as my own bout with cancer. We also welcomed a new addition to our family this spring, a baby boy. With fear and trembling, we struggle to keep our priorities in order. And for us, our children's health and the health of our neighbors comes before football. We fully recognize that being able to make a decision like this is a privilege. End quote. I don't think this is necessarily surprising news, Paul. It's been well documented. The battle that his son has had to go through. Nate Solder has certainly talked about it publicly beforehand. And I think we at least had anticipated that it was a possibility. And yesterday it was made official. And now obviously the conversation will move forward in terms of the Giants having a mix between some youth as well as some veterans who they brought in via free agency. You know, you talk about Nate Solder, and Lance, I'm sure you will agree with me, and I, and I don't think anybody who has met Nate Solder would disagree. He's a pro's pro, a very honorable man, uh, a guy who has just got a tremendous amount of character, and I guarantee you that this was a difficult decision for him, but once he sat down and sorted through the equation, he understood that, hey, family is first, got to make this decision, and it is what it is. But knowing Solder, I think, as well as we do over the two years that he's been with the Giants, I can tell you that he probably struggled with it because he is one of those guys who does also feel, in addition to family first, he feels a great deal of responsibility to his teammates and to the organization. He is a class guy, and I don't think he took this decision very lightly at all. I would agree with you. Plus, remember, he also comes over from the New England Patriots. He has an established relationship with Joe Judge Paul, going back to when Nate Solder first came into the league, a special teams contributor. So, you know, you take that into consideration on top of, obviously, his dedication to his teammates. And yes, I don't think it was an easy decision by any standard. And I would say that's the case probably for most players that have opted out. I think what's interesting when we've had conversations with other individuals who cover the league, I think a popular question was, well, now that the opt-out is an option within the revised CBA, how many players are actually going to take advantage of it? What's the volume going to be like? And I think that there was an assortment of answers, Paul, to start. And what we're seeing over the last few days is there have been a number of guys, and there's been multiple guys on New England. A lot of Nate Solder's former teammates have decided to opt out. Obviously, everybody comes from a different perspective and a different rationale, but I guess I've been a little bit surprised in terms of maybe the volume of players who have decided to opt out considering the finances in the NFL compared to other professional leagues where you're dealing with a lot of non-guaranteed contracts. Well, I think ultimately, Lance, when push comes to shove, regardless of what the money situation is, if you've got anybody either in your family, you know, your immediate family, I'm talking about people who live in your household, or you have had a medical issue in the past, and we know that the NFL and the Players Association identified 15 medical afflictions, if you will, that if they are on your history, they would be acceptable for the high-risk opt-out. I mean, to me, that kind of overrides anything, including money. People say that money is everything. Well, it's not everything. My grandmother, God rest her soul, uh, you know, she made it well into her 90s. She always said to me, if you have your health, you have everything. Yeah. And the rest of it will take care of itself. And I really believe that ultimately that's the overwhelming factor, regardless of the finances that you're talking about. Well, good words to live by. I certainly would support that statement. And the only reason why I bring up the finances, it's not necessarily the individuals who are of note. There are, let's face it, Paul, there's a lot of guys who understand, hey, the lifespan of an NFL player is sometimes only in the ballpark of two to three years if you're fortunate. So I guess I'm looking at it through that lens, which is why it goes back to none of these decisions were made easily when you're weighing your long-term viability in the league, knowing somebody's always out to take your position and your spot versus the financials in terms of what you may be surrendering and once again, your stability and place on the roster. And then on top of that, we get into, of course, the health risks and the family. So everybody, once again, is weighing things from a different angle. Nate Solder, he doesn't, to me, at the end of the day, nor would I say any other player, Paul, 
Nobody has to give an explanation why they're choosing to opt out. Because at the end of the day, it's part of the revised CBA. They sat down at the negotiating table. The union, as well as the league, agreed that this was an option. So if any player wants to take advantage of it, they have nothing to prove. They have nothing to defend themselves. They don't have to explain themselves. The bottom line is it's an option. If they want to exercise it, great. If they don't, then they could sign up and play. But they're entitled to fully take advantage of the opt-out clause. And I think it's important to stress that because sometimes we lose perspective with respect to that side of things. Well, as you mentioned, the opt-out clause was negotiated as part of the CBA because of the pandemic. And when you consider that the players who do opt-out still get the accrued year, the high-risk players, get the accrued year on their NFL ledger and their contracts simply get put on hold and then pushed forward an additional year, it makes it a heck of a lot easier for them to swallow, I would think. I I don't know if all of those conditions were put in place through the agreements that the labor union and the NFL wound up entertaining that some of these players would have necessarily made this decision. But I think the circumstances that were created just make it much more palatable, if you will. Lance Meadow, Paul DeTito with you here on Thursday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live. So the big news, clearly, Nate Solder deciding to opt out. He will not play in 2020. As Paul mentioned, his contract essentially is paused, and then everything is moved back a year in terms of what's remaining on his contract. But there's certainly time to get into that, and I don't think anybody's overly concerned about the 2021 finances. Let's now focus, Paul, on what this means for the offensive line, because that, to me, is the most pressing topic. Now, Nate Solder, we talked about was looking for a bounce back season an opportunity for him to step back into that left tackle spot he's no longer an option so now they have multiple options to experiment with at left tackle as well as right tackle I think the first guy that comes to mind Paul is clearly their first round pick this year and that's Andrew Thomas who has experience on the right side and the left side at Georgia I have mentioned this time and time again. I don't think just because you're drafted that high means you have to start out on the left side. Tyron Smith of the Cowboys did not start on the left side. Jason Peters did not start on the left side. And those are two very well-known left tackles within the NFC East. But now all of a sudden the door is opening because of Nate Solder opting out that it may not hurt to try to give Andrew Thomas as much experience as humanly possible right out of the gate, sort of a baptism by fire, to throw him into the left side if they feel he's ready and they see enough in the limited padded practices and begin his development right on the left side at the beginning of his NFL career. I agree with you, Lance. I think that's what we're going to wind up seeing. Andrew Thomas will be the starting left tackle opening day. Cameron Fleming will be the starting right tackle on opening day. And I think at least at the outset, Nick Gates is probably going to be the swing tackle because of his experience and because you cannot expect Paird to be ready. I just don't see any way in the world that Paird could be ready coming out of UConn, knowing he's going to have to get stronger, he's going to have to bulk up, and obviously being a rookie thrown in during this pandemic is a very difficult situation from the get-go. So I would think that at some point he will be the third tackle, but early in the season for sure, probably the whole season, Gates is going to wind up being the third tackle. At least that's how I would play it. And I'm completely with you. I think Paird is viewed as a developmental offensive lineman at this point. And what's unfortunate is the fact that he hasn't been out on the field. So if you're going to say, and granted, who knows what's going to happen, but if there's only 14 padded practices, and you're going to say that he's going to have enough opportunity to show to the coaches that he warrants one of the starting jobs on top of the fact, and remember, the goal, Paul, at the end of the day is always to put the five best offensive linemen on the field, but... Daniel Jones is still a relatively young quarterback, okay? He hasn't even had a full year under his belt as a starter. I think it's a fair question in Mark Colombo's eyes, Joe Judge's eyes, the rest of the coaching staff on the offensive side, specifically Jason Garrett. Do you really want to begin the season when you had not had any OTAs and you have 14 padded practices with two rookie tackles in week one protecting your young quarterback? I just don't know. Just forget the X's and O's on the field, Paul. Just the mindset of, do you really want to throw two rookies out on the edge against, oh, by the way, Bud Dupree and T.J. Watt? 
I just don't know if that's a situation the Giants want to be thrown into immediately to start the season. No, I don't think that would necessarily be a very tasty situation either. Now, here's the one thing that I do want to stress, okay? We know that both Thomas in his college career and Fleming in his pro career have played each of the sides. So we're not talking about guys who are going to be thrown into unfamiliar territory. So to me, what you want to do is find the best combination. Now, it does seem to me that Thomas, because of his freshness at the left tackle spot, remember that's where we played last year for Georgia, he's probably better off just staying there than throwing him back to the right side, which is where he was earlier in his collegiate career. Let's just keep him where he's most comfortable because that's where he played last fall. At the same time, Remmers, who over the last two years with the Cowboys, his only six starts Fleming, you're with Dallas. Yeah. Oh, Fleming. Yes, Fleming. Good catch. Fleming's only six starts with the Cowboys over the last two years was at left tackle, but he did start the final five games of the regular season in 2017 with the Patriots as a right tackle. Over those five games, he gave up a combined one and a half sacks over five games. That is not so bad. And quite frankly, according to my film study, and you know, you know I, I do the best that I can, but I also admit that there's got to be an asterisk on this stuff, Lance, because as much as I study tape, we also don't know everything that goes into the plays. I had Mike Remmers giving up four sacks last season as the Giants' starting right tackle. And, of course, you'll remember at the very end of the year he missed a couple of games because he, his back was sore. Now, here's the thing with Remmers. Remmers came in with low expectations. He was coming in as a functional guy, an insurance policy, and a guy who, if he had to start, you felt like, all right, maybe he would do an adequate job. Well, in my mind, he gave them every single piece of value for their dollar. That's exactly what he did. I would sign up for that today if Cam Fleming starts at right tackle all season and only gives up four sacks. I would, I would take that in a heartbeat. And I do believe that Remmers and Fleming are on the same level as players. I think both of these guys are functional, solid veterans. They're both effort guys. They're both very, very smart guys. They have both shown versatility. They have both played for winning teams. I truly believe they are very, very similar in so many ways. So the, the standard under which Fleming steps into the right tackle spot isn't too lofty for him to, to hold it down and to be functional. Now, on the other side, you talk about Thomas being thrown into the deep end of the pool. Well, unofficially, I had Nate Solder giving up 14 and a half sacks last year. We know about the four-sack game that Barrett hit him for down in Tampa Bay. But he also uh, had a... Um, a number of other games where he did not play well, give it up multiple sacks. I got a game here against Dallas. I got a game against Philadelphia. I got a game against Minnesota. We all know, it's well documented, that he had his troubles all season long for a variety of reasons. It totaled up to 14 and a half sacks, according to my tape study. I seriously doubt that Andrew Thomas, even as a rookie, is going to come in and give up 14 and a half sacks. I really do. I doubt that. So I guess what I'm saying to you is I don't see this opt-out as necessarily a, a horrible hole that now suddenly has to be patched. I actually believe the Giants are going to be able to navigate this. And I will tell you something else. Uh, Fleming and Thomas are both better run blockers than they are pass blockers. And that even plays more into Jason Garrett's hands as he tries to stress the running game with the Giants. So I hope maybe some folks out there who are incredibly upset and nervous about how are the Giants going to plug this dam, maybe I've talked some sense into them and told them that maybe this doesn't have to be so bad. Well, one of the things we've been talking about all offseason is I think there's more depth on the offensive line than we've seen in recent history. So I think that boded well for the Giants even before Nate Solder opted out because you figured you had options. 
God forbid there's an injury that comes about. And also you have multiple tackles, specifically on the roster, that we just hit on that could play both on the right side and the left side. And here's the other thing that can't be lost in this conversation, Paul. The swing tackle position is just as critical as the starters in my mind. You need to have a reliable swing tackle. And if Nick Gates does get thrown into that role, well, you have a player that started a few games at right tackle last year, also has a versatility to play multiple positions on the offensive line. You could do a lot worse than saying Nick Gates is going to be your swing guy. That can't be overlooked. That is just as important. I think what's also important to note with Cam Fleming is he is used to being thrown in a variety of roles. He's been asked by New England in previous years to step in and start. Remember, when Nate Solder suffered a season-ending injury in 2015, coincidentally, Cam Fleming was the guy that actually replaced Nate Solder. So, you know, those guys are used to having to be thrown into a variety of roles because Solder also had been involved in special teams early in his career. And then when Tyron Smith got hurt, they threw Fleming onto the left side. So yes. I like the fact that Cam Fleming, it's nothing new to him. If you ask him to be a swing tackle, he can step into that role. You ask him to be a right tackle, he can step into that role. And if God forbid you need him on the left side, he can handle that as well. You need a player that can be a jack of all trades. I think that's extremely encouraging. The second factor, and this is why I think he has a significant advantage over Nick Gates and Matt Paird, but maybe this is more relevant to the comparison to Nick Gates, is he knows the system. Okay, let's not also throw that to the side. He was with Mark Colombo and he's with Jason Garrett each of the last sure. two seasons, right, Paul? And 14 padded practices, no OTAs. Who do you feel comfortable throwing in at the right side if you have limited time to get a team ready and an offense ready for week one? I feel pretty good about turning to a player that knows the nuts and bolts of the offense and also who has a good read on what Jason Garrett wants to do, to your point with the rushing attack, and also Mark Colombo knows Fleming's strengths and weaknesses, having been around him each of the last two seasons, and understands what he can handle, and maybe what they need to slowly work with him moving forward. So I think when you evaluate all of these factors, Thomas on the left, Fleming on the right, seems to be the most logical mover, maneuver, at least as it stands right now, barring any new developments that take place once they get out of the practice field, and then feeling good that Nick Gates could be the swing guy and Matt Parrott, depending on what he shows from a developmental side of things, can be an option five weeks into the season, middle of the season, as they move him along. I would agree with you, and quite frankly, let's talk about Gates for just a second. Last year, two starts at right tackle and one start at right guard, and then obviously, you know, some some bit uh, token appearances over the course of the season. He did not commit a penalty, and he did not give up a sack. Now, I get it, okay? It was a small sample size, but for the time being, if Nick Gates has to be your number three, I can live with that. And quite honestly, based on some of the other offensive lines the Giants have played with over the last handful of years, I think we would both agree that these options are a heck of a lot better than what we've seen. Well, because when we've seen injuries, unfortunately, occur to the starting offensive linemen, you know, sometimes they've had to turn to players that are just young and inexperienced, or they don't really have that proven veteran, so they're mixing and matching. And I don't think they're necessarily in that position this year, so that at least is a very well, encouraging aspect. Let's, let's make it even more obvious, Lance. How about sometimes the options they had to turn to weren't very good? Well, that also is the case. <laughs> but what I'm saying is I remember years, too, where it was throwing in a guy that did not have a lot of reps coming in. And on the fly, you're saying to yourself, hey, establish this side of the offensive line. And, you know, sometimes that's rolling the dice. And the other thing, of course, was the lack of execution. There's no doubt about it. Now, so the goal is they want to be better prepared, especially, by the way, in a season, Paul, when you're not just dealing with the injury bug, you're dealing with the coronavirus, that you never know when you're going to lose a player. That's more of a reason to have four guys right now in the conversation that you can move to the right side or the left side, depending on how things play out. Now, let me ask you a question, Lance, and I know you've been watching the game for a while too now, so this shouldn't be foreign to you. What is the quickest way for an offensive lineman, specifically a tackle, to getting his quarterback killed? Well, breaking down, I think, from an execution standpoint would be the first see, thing. No, no, no. Actually, I disagree. It's a busted assignment. Well, when to you, me, that's the lack that, of execution. It, well, execution is physical. A busted assignment is mental. And, and if you're letting a guy come free because you didn't have your right pickup, that, to me, is the quickest way to get your quarterback killed. 
It's one thing if you get physically beaten. It is totally unacceptable when you bust an assignment. And I think that's another thing we have to keep in mind about Cam Fleming because no matter who we've talked to, and we've had people from the Patriots and the Cowboys past who he played with or was coached by, we've had them on our show over the course of the last few months. And all of them said that Fleming, who we happen to know, I believe he was an aerospace major at Stanford. He's incre- He was an astronaut science major, as a matter of fact. That is what my friend from the Patriots sent me. He was an astronaut science major. He is incredibly intelligent has a very high football acumen. He is a real good effort guy. And one of the things that I was told, and you, I believe you were on the show when we when we talked to, to Kitna, uh, John Kitna, the former quarterback, he is a very, very, very high effort guy who will give you everything he's got. It may not be pretty. It may not be technically sound. It may be flat out ugly. But he knows who he's got to pick up. He knows the play. He knows what he has to do. And, yes, there will be times physically he gets beaten. That's just going to be the case. That's why he's not a contender to go to the Pro Bowl every year because he's not on that level as a player. But I will go to the grocery store with a guy who brings his traits any day of the week because at least that gives me a sporting chance as opposed to a guy who can't get the plays down, who's going to bust assignments left and right and wind up getting my quarterback knocked out by the third quarter of the first game. 